This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. The story of music history is a story of constant reinvention. New styles rise, have their moment in the spotlight, and then fade away, reabsorbed into the surrounding culture. But every once in a while, a genre comes along that's so special that it gets to stick around, influencing new musical ideas for generations to come. We saw this with jazz, with rock, and we may be in the process of seeing it with hip-hop too, but all of those are built on the back of probably the most important musical style in the history of modern music, the blues. It'd be impossible to describe the entire genre of the blues in one video, so today I'm just going to focus on one of its most immediately recognizable elements, the 12-bar blues progression. It's arguably the most influential chord progression ever, used to great effect not just by blues musicians but also by jazz, rock, and other artists, but what exactly makes it so great? To answer that question, we're gonna have to talk about the history of the 12-bar blues. The blues as a musical genre was developed in the late 1800s by black communities in the Deep South, based primarily on the influence of traditional African music blended with elements of the European-based music of the world they and their ancestors had been forcibly transplanted into. There's still a lot we don't know about this early period of the blues, in part because it was an almost exclusively oral tradition shared in small communities of oppressed people, so a lot of the story has sadly been lost along with the people who told it. Musicologist Eileen Southern cited a New Orleans blues fiddler from the time as saying, ain't no first blues, the blues always been, and in a sense, that's true. It's always hard to pin down the first example of a new musical style, but in the case of the blues, we don't even know the candidates. The progenitors of the genre have largely been lost to history. But while we'll probably never know who invented the blues, we do know who helped popularize it, and a large amount of credit for that belongs to a composer named W.C. Handy. According to Handy's autobiography, he was first drawn to the blues in 1903 at a Mississippi train station, where he heard a man singing and playing what he described as the weirdest music he'd ever heard. It reminded Handy of the folk music of his childhood in Alabama, and that encounter inspired him to experiment with these ideas in his own work. This event eventually led him to write Memphis Blues, also known as Mr. Crump, which, though stylistically more like ragtime music than what you might think of as the blues today, is still widely considered one of the first published pieces to use the now-famous 12-bar blues pattern, and Handy's success brought new attention to the genre and its signature song form. So what is that form? Well, like the blues itself, it's hard to precisely define. The most basic version, though, looks something like this. We get four bars of the one chord, two bars of four, go back to the one for two more bars, then five, four, one, one, and even in this simple form, we can start to see what makes the blues approach to harmony so different from the traditional European one. European classical music is all about cadences and resolutions. Pieces feature long, winding progressions that eventually work their way to a final resting point, often with the help of the famous 5-1 resolution, but the blues doesn't do that. The chords it uses would be familiar to any student of the common practice era. 1, 4, and 5 are collectively known as the primary triads because they're the three most important chords in the key. But they're not really arranged to give you any sense of resolution. We only get the 5 chord for one bar, and instead of going back to one, it slides down to four. Some theorists view this as an explicit rejection or modification of European ideas, while others view it as simply the natural result of a different, more African-influenced musical vocabulary. Since we can't precisely trace its roots, it's hard to say for sure, but personally, if I had to bet, I'd lean towards the second explanation. But again, this is just the most basic version of the 12-bar pattern. There's two changes that we almost always see in modern blues-based music. The first is what's called a turnaround, where the one chord in the final bar is replaced with another chord, usually usually the five, in order to mark the end of the phrase and set up a return to the top. The turnaround is also often marked by an increase in dynamics and a strong rhythmic figure in order to make it more of an event, standing out against the backdrop of the song. Ending a phrase on the five chord like this helps provide a sense of continuity. It creates dissonance, and by the time it resolves, the progression's already started again. The other common change is replacing these major triads with dominant seventh chords. This is a much more clear departure from the European harmonic vocabulary. In common practice music, dominant seventh chords are seen as strongly directional. There's only one in each key, and playing it points the listener's ear back towards that key's root. But in the blues, we see dominant sevenths all over the place. Sometimes they resolve where we'd expect, but other times they seem perfectly happy to sit still or go somewhere completely different. They're just not treated as directional devices. Instead, they serve a different purpose. Bite. There's some debate as to whether or not it's accurate to describe them as dissonant, because that implies they want to resolve to some sort of consonance, but either way, it's certainly true that the notes of the dominant seventh chord rub against each other in a pretty noticeable way. The difference, though, is that this isn't seen as a bad thing. It's just a part of the sound of the blues. It's also a very convenient adaptation for one of the blues' most famous playing techniques, the slide guitar. Many musicians would just tune their instruments to an open chord, then slide a finger, bottleneck, metal bar, or even a knife up and down the strings to play different chords. 
ones. This meant that you could only really use one chord quality, or else you'd have to fret with additional fingers as well, so making everything dominant made actually playing the chords a lot easier. But this is all further complicated by the fact that these may not originally have been dominant sevenths at all. We're getting into contested historical territory here, but some sources I found claim that the dominant sevenths in the modern blues progression were actually an adaptation of the harmonic seventh chord. What's that? Well, there's a good chance you've never heard one before because you can't play them on conventionally tuned instruments, but basically... Okay, so here's the thing. When you hear a note, what you're really hearing is a sound wave with a specific frequency, and when you hear multiple notes at once, your ear effectively calculates the ratio between those frequencies, which is what we call an interval, or if you stack enough of them, a chord. The major triad pretty closely approximates the ratio 4 to 5 to 6, so you might be wondering what happens if you slap a 7 on the end of that. Well, that gives you a harmonic 7th chord, but the note you just added is about halfway between a minor 7th and a major 6th, which means you're not going to find it on your piano. However, since blues guitarists often custom-tune their instruments by ear, it would have been relatively easy for them to include a harmonic 7th, giving them a chord that looked like a dominant 7th, but was much more at rest with itself. However, as far as I could find, this is just speculation. Again, there's a lot we don't know for certain about the early days of the blues. The strongest endorsement of this theory that I could find is on the Wikipedia page for the harmonic 7th, which claims that frequent use of this chord is one of the defining characteristics of blues harmony, but it doesn't include a citation, and every other source I've looked at either describes this as an unproven theory or just calls them dominant sevenths. Now, if I had to bet, I'd say this explanation was probably correct. It makes a lot of sense, both from a practical tuning perspective and because blues music does make frequent use of what are called blue notes, which are notes in between the standard piano keys, including the harmonic seventh interval, but as for whether the harmonic seventh chord was a foundational part of the early blues tradition, I just don't know. It's possible someone else does, and I just couldn't find it, but it's also very possible that this is another casualty of our lack of records on early blues culture. If you do have a definitive source on this, though, please let me know. Back to the progression, there's some other common variations, like the quick change blues where you swap out the one chord in the second bar for a brief visit to the four, interrupting the otherwise incredibly long period of static harmony and bringing in a bit more motion, but the blues innovated with more than just chords. At least as important as the harmony was what was happening over it. That is, the melody. I probably could have just said melody, couldn't I? Anyway, blues melodies were often built on call and response patterns between the singer and their instrument, likely borrowing from the African-American traditions of field haulers and spirituals. In terms of notes, the basic phrases were fairly simple, but performances tended to feature significant embellishment of those phrases, often involving moans, whistles, and notes from the blues scale. This is, again, complicated. These days, the term blues scale usually refers to the collection of notes you get when you take the minor scale, remove the two notes a tritone apart to get minor pentatonic, and then add in the note a tritone above the root, cause hey, why not? But in actual practice, blues musicians would often use notes from outside this collection, including, as I mentioned before, the famous blue notes, microtonal pitches that bent outside the traditional piano key notes for the sake of expression. And of course, it's worth recognizing that this scale doesn't actually contain most of the notes in our blues progression. For starters, the major thirds from all our dominant seventh chords are nowhere to be found. By the rules of common practice, this scale doesn't seem like it fits over the 12-bar blues. But if you listen to blues-based music, then you already know that it does, which is further evidence that the blues is just using a different musical vocabulary. Again, just like with the dominant chords, what we might call dissonance doesn't really carry the same sense of tonal obligation here. It's just a part of the sound, an extra flavor that the musicians can create, and that new approach to allegedly dissonant notes, viewing them as valid sounds on their own instead of needing to resolve to something more consonant, went on to have a profound influence on jazz, rock, funk, metal, country, hip-hop, and basically every other genre that's developed in the last century or so. The blues is everywhere. It's one of the most important musical inventions in American history, and while there's certainly way more to it than just the 12 bar pattern, that single progression is still ingrained in almost every corner of our modern musical culture. The 12-bar blues is one of the first techniques many musicians learn, and it's helped launch thousands of careers, but these days, if you want your music to reach an audience, you need to record it, and Skillshare has some great courses to help you do just that. I'd especially recommend the series by Grammy-nominated audio engineer Young Guru. He's done one on mixing, another on recording and mastering in a cheap home studio, and he has one on DJing too, if that's more your speed. He's worked with some of the biggest names in the music industry, including Beyonce and Jay-Z, and his knowledge and experience really come through in his classes. If you want to check that out, Skillshare is offering two free months of premium membership to the first 512 tone viewers to click the link in the description, giving you access not only to Young Guru's courses, but also thousands of other lessons on all sorts of topics like music production, songwriting, guitar, piano, and more, plus non-musical stuff like art, software engineering, and cooking. It's a great resource, and with premium plans starting under 10 bucks a month after your two-month trial, it's also a pretty great deal. And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to this video's featured patron, Susan and Jones. If you want to help out and help us pick the songs we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.